Okay. No rest of anything. Okay, rolling, rolling sound. <coughs> We're we doing all this with the GoPro. No, no. <coughs> both. <coughs> Gosh, okay, it He's got a wide shot with the GoPro, and then he can just push in and get tight shots on each of us. Why don't you figure out what you're going to talk about? Uh, I have no idea, but I figure we can matter. continue the conversation from this morning. You know, uh, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I, I mean, I would have thought what would really be interesting is the fact that, you know, Jim's in New Zealand, we're over in Australia, and, and yet the similar developments, realisations, um, but still doing it in a different way. I think that's probably, just off the top of my yeah. head, yeah. a good thing, a good thing to put out there. Yeah. Even though it's been done in two different places, there are significant differences in certain things we do. There are other similarities, but... We both see the, the incredible outcome it has on the participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, well what's that the, works for what's me. What's the aim of this talk? What well, that's what we're just figuring out. I mean, um, you know, it's... Is it promotional? Uh, not, no, I mean... Who's it going to be shown to? Well, ideally, it would be footage <coughs> that at some point might wend its way into the long-form Rites of Passage film that I make. Right. Um, but the more immediate practical use is just put it up online uh, on, in my Rites of Passage website and, uh, you know, under the sort of Wisdom of the Ages section uh, with interviews of both of you eventually and also all of the other interviews I have with Mead and Bly and Meredith Little and Angeli Zarian, etc. So, you know, it's a, it'll be as kind of a public publicly available record of knowledge and information around the subject matter. How well do you know Michael Mead? Well, do I, how well? Yeah. Not at all, hardly. Right. Yeah. Where's he based? Seattle. California? Uh, is Washington. That is that the other side or the same side? No, it's the same side of the country. Yeah, he, and he comes to the San Francisco area uh, every now and then. He still uh, seems to be very active. He is really active, yeah. But he's also, you know, he's not a team player. I mean, he's a guy who's going to be the head of his own show. So I didn't even think to invite him, for example, to Oakland. Should I go and visit him? Uh, I think it would be great if he'd sit down with you. But uh, my hunch is he probably would. Must be in his late seventies, eighties. Oh, I don't think he's eighties. I don't even know if he's late seventies, but maybe he looks up. Yeah, maybe early to mid. <coughs> We're rolling all the way across. Okay, great. There's your slate. Um, well, that works for me. Uh, you know, I, d I didn't really have a deep agenda for, for what the conversation is. So let's do that. Let's sort of compare and contrast, you know, what your experiences have both been, uh, in, in your case, Australia and yours in New Zealand. And, uh, uh, and maybe we can weave in some of your forebearers and influences and uh, and yeah. and hoped outcomes as well. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say, you know, I'd really like to appreciate the support that you Australians have given us because we, we came in 10 years behind you and you mentored us and you opened your program to us. So at an early developmental level, we were able to I remember when Jay and Adge came back from your program, they said, we've got it, we've got a format. This day is called separation, this day is called building community, this day is called transition, and this day is the return, honoring and return. You know. So we had it. So, so four days. Four segments rather than days, but yeah, uh, can yeah. be in days, yeah. but they're, you know, but that was the original structure that you had. Yeah, that basically. there was a separation. There but I hear a community building as day two or yeah. part two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we always felt that if we were, you know, we're, we're looking at taking men and boys into a deep place and doing, uh, you know, a rite of passage process and that it's important we build the community so that we can actually do that well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental to the work that we're doing. It's community work. And, and we have a lot of people... There's such a breakdown in community. A lot of people don't even have a community, and, and and you know rites of passage involve the individuals and the community. So it's very important for us 
at the start of our work that we build a community within our container to do the work. Yeah, and then we into that structure, that basic bones of the structure that you, they brought back. We, in, 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 in our rituals, our process. And straight away we tried doing the major challenge that you guys did, and that we felt into that. And we started with 12 year olds, and after a year or two we came out of those major ritual challenges and we, and we, what we saw with these different styles of speaking, uh, and the, where we get up and we walk around the circle and so on and so forth, I think it's easier to see the body language of the people that are speaking. We decided to move it up a notch to 13 or 14 year old, because when they come, it's really important. Because yeah. they're uh, too young, they don't get it. Yeah. The other thing is the major difference that we made was to separate the boy and the father on the first day. So the boys went into separate home groups and the fathers went into their own home group, which is different from what you did and continue to do. You have the fathers and son together. And so we didn't explore that at all. And, uh, you know, uh, there's merits on both sides, of course. Yeah, I mean, I have to say this is something I find so interesting, which is it's it's good 10 years since, yeah. um, you know, your guys, Jay and Edge came over from New Zealand. And in that time, you know, at that time, maybe we had a similar program or the ideas of a similar program. And since then, you know, both of us have modified our programs and there are things that we still do the same and there are things that we do really quite differently. Yeah. And, and yet, the outcomes are very much the same in that it has a profound impact on the boys, has a profound impact on their fathers, and, and in fact has a profound impact on the communities. Mm. And what this really says to me is that there are many different ways of actually creating a rite of passage. The, the, the part that for me stays constant is that we have the three stages. There's a separation, there's a transition period, and then there's a return. And, and, that, and within the transition period, we share stories, we create a challenge, we honor the individual gifts and talents, genius and spirit of the boy, and we do a vision for the future. The elements remain the same. How they are done can, can be incredibly different. Yeah, and we would say true to that as well. What you speak there is the same with us after 12 years now. Yeah. yeah. And we've got to that and we're, that's the basic bones and, of the thing and what we're doing now is we're building depth and <coughs> by having many of the different men, father, not fathers, but many of the different facilitators in different roles holding different rituals. You know, um, <coughs> I'm sorry if I did I cut yeah. you off? No. Well, you know, one of the things that really interests me is, uh, yes, you've been through changes and adapted. How much have those changes been mandated by geography, peculiar to where you are, and also by culture? You know, in particular, indigenous cultures, but maybe not. Maybe dominant cultures, you know, mainstream cultures. Yeah. I mean, my answer to that would be, I think changes should be mandated by geography and culture. That's the way it's supposed to be. In our studies of rites of passage around the world, what we found was that every single community had a rite of passage, but they all did it, they did it differently. They still had the same elements. They would always take the boys away. They would always do a transformational process and they would always come back. But how they did it, you know, if we just even look at the, the, the sharing of stories, you know, the stories can be shared by actually sitting down and sharing stories, or you can have a storyteller, but some communities shared their stories through songs, some shared them through dances, some shared them through cave paintings. So the concept of sharing stories remains the same. How it's done can vary. The challenges, a Maasai warrior had to go out and kill a, a lion with a spear. A boy in Vanuatu had to climb up a tower made of bamboo and tie a vine around his ankle and jump off. A, a pygmy 
uh, in, in, in Africa used to have to climb a tree and a huge tree and get honey. Completely different, but they're all challenges. Right, but so what I'm interested in is the peculiarities or particularities is a better word, you know, that you uh, brought in, you know, to adapt. Yeah. Look, do you want to you answer that first, yeah, Jim? I, I think what I, what I can remember is that we had to adapt our process to what we have. In other words, we have an outdoor event uh, nature is the big medicine. So when you try and put a city boy in the bush, yeah, overnight, and he pisses with rain, you know, he, that's not okay. And uh, so we, we had to adapt. Uh, that's an extreme um, suggestion. Um, what we had to do was to blend and build our rituals and the way our program ran to the environment and of course this is this is true from the fact point of view that we are here an intentional community so uh, it's, uh, the, the land belongs to the uh, to a, a, a group of people is held in common when we've gone out and we've tried to develop programs out there what we found the main problem has been to find land. As we tried several areas of land down in uh, Christchurch, Wellington, and the Coromandel. I think the Coromandel are doing programs. And we managed to transfer. They're using a different major ritual, and they're on their fourth or fifth different piece of land. It's very interesting. Well, and to talk a little <coughs> bit more about how Rites of Passage is an outgrowth of this intentional community and, in effect, also an input. So there's a kind of a circularity to the Rites of Passage here. Yeah, I came here 25 years ago, and uh, the community was bare bones. It had been going for five years, and there were 150 acres here, and only half the houses were built. and. Uh, and uh, we're at the end of a dirt road 30 kilometers from a very small town. And so what was the advantage of that, looking back at what the advantage of that was, that we ended up, you know, after I'd been here a couple of three years, we ended up including my kids, not Jay, who's older, but his brother, there was 15 or 20 teenagers growing up here, and they didn't get to go to town because, you know, we didn't all have cars, so we uh, were here. So we had to experience that teenage revolution. And after a time, so this is, the, that, was the, that was the place where the rites of passage um, started. And we realized that we, they, they formed this tribe and they were powerful. So we, Susie and I started inviting them here. to this, Oh, just put, hold on, we just got to change the digital card here. So Susie and I, who have five boys... Um, hang, hang on, just a second. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so starting with this 15 teenagers, and they were all housed in, in one location, right? Or No. No, they, they were living with their, their families. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Okay, so we have 15 to 20 teenagers and their friends because their friends saw this as a free space to come and, and live. So Susie and I would arrive back after going and see a film in the local town. And we'd drive into the car park down there and we'd hear this boom, 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 boom. And we'd go, oh my God, that's our house. In fact, when we moved up, we put a teepee out at the back of the house then, we moved up. And then we come in here and there were bodies all over the floor. So eventually we uh, did something with that and we organized the uh, dinner that they came here for every month. And they regretted, they came together and they formed a group and we facilitated a bit. And the, some of their choices were well, we don't want to hear this person in there, we don't want that person there. So they got to choose. And they became politically 
important. So we got them to come up with what they wanted from this place, because they were pissed off, you know, they wanted to be in town where they thought all the fun was. So they came into the community meetings, which we hold every week, but they said, we don't want to be on your agenda, we want to be the first item up, right? So they went for things like a $2,000 bicycle court and things like that, which happened. So they got the message. Then we started doing events with them now out on the west coast called the Movable, Movable Feast. Mm. Except the Movable Feast didn't move anyway. We used to count on a west coast river and they surfed and hung out for a week or ten days or so. And, you know, that's how the thing grew from there. And uh, then we were doing the men's gatherings at the same time. So sometimes the boys would come and sit in the trees while the men were telling stories and having a circle. And uh, so we gradually moved on until this American man, Eric Speakerman, said, you've got to start doing youth work. You've got to start doing rites of passage program. So we did. So we started coming and visiting with you folks, Anna, traveling with Jay around the world to pick out the information uh, to gradually build the program. That's the story. I want to hear your answer to that, the particularities about adaptation, you know, geography and culture. Um, yeah, the biggest adaptation, I would say, for us is to find a way that we can make our program uh, suit and comfortable in, in what I call the mainstream. So that, you know, we're, we're doing a rite of passage, which, you know, first of all, a lot of people have an issue with the words rites of passage and, and, and a lack of understanding. And yet we, you know, very much wanted to attract into our program people from the cities and people from very sort of straight schooling and, and, and work environments. So um, there was a lot of adaptation to just make people feel safe to come along. Because what we recognised very early on was that if people were uh, intimidated or felt uncomfortable with their introduction to the work we were doing, they would just step out. The, the, the easiest thing today is to step out. And if at any point along the way there's an easy option or a reason to step out, people will. So, you know, our adaptation really had to be you know, instead of, hey, every boy just has to go on a rite of passage, there's no discussion, where's your one gonna go? We actually, first of all, had to persuade people that it was even necessary. And, and, and the way to do that was to really uh, share the message around that we want your boys to do well, we wanna help them not go off the rails, and we believe that you know, their growth and their relationship with you, their parents, at this stage in their lives is critical. And, and so it was about finding a way to deliver the message in a very non-confrontational, um, academic even, manner that parents could really relate to and then have them go, yeah, I want my son to do this program. So. You know, that's probably been our, our biggest adaptation. And then, you know, a lot of our work is based on looking at what was common to rites of passage around the world. And, you know, one of the things was that there was a challenge. And we're doing work with boys, and typically in a boy's challenge in a rite of passage, he had to face death. He had to face his own mortality. And in fact, there had to be a chance he could die. A real chance. and you know, as I often say, they would send out 20 boys and they might only get 16 back. Well, we can't do that. We have to bring every single one of them back in good shape. So, you know, there, there, there is a challenge to create a challenge that is in fact powerful enough for the boys to get it. And, you know, we live in such a protective society and, and we have their fathers or a mentor on the program and, and, you know, we have to get permission from their fathers uh, who are often in their own stuff around the whole thing. 
you know, so, so that gets tricky. Well, and it's also an insurance-driven and a litigious society yeah. as well. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, if, if we create a challenge that's too soft for the boys, are we doing them any favours? You know, if, if, we, if, we, if our challenge is based on the fathers, you know, it, what we say is if the fathers create the challenge, they'll either make it too soft or too hard. And it's about doing something where the boys really feel like they have been stretched. Um, but at the same time, we can't psychologically over traumatize them mm -hmm. because, you know, that's not our mandate. We don't have permission to do that. So, you know, just adopting. Not, not, not over traumatize, just traumatize them. Well, you know. And you don't truly want to traumatize them. No, we don't want to traumatize them, but you know, we, if failure. Yeah, yeah, we do want to take them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, and, and as soon as someone goes out of their comfort zone, I mean, if someone has always been kept in a comfortable zone and is totally over, you know, protected and everything, take them out of their comfort zone in any way, and you're already in a, in a trauma scenario. And you know, one of my concerns is that we're meeting quite a few kids who, you know, really have very little resilience mm -hmm. and have had very few life experiences. And Jim mentioned about making the ages older. You know, we've increased the age for our boys. We dropped it back to 12 about 10 years ago because we felt a lot of them were street smart. And we've now increased it to at least 14, if not 15, because what we're finding is that so many of the kids are spending so much time on technology they are superheroes in their bedroom on their computer, but in real life, they're actually very soft. Mm -hmm. And we can't do this work with them until they've actually had some real life experiences, until a couple of things have gone wrong for them. And if we do it when they're too young, they can say the right words, maybe they can say the right things, but they don't actually get it on a deeper level. So, you know, there's, we can still use those principles, you know, story, challenge, honouring and vision, but, you know, I believe we have a, a strong responsibility to be very aware of what's going on in the field, what's happening in the community, and how we adapt to that. Yeah, we use the expression, uh, sell short. You know, I don't want to sell you short in, in terms of the trial of the ordeal, yeah. you know, to push yeah. it or not, yeah. you know. Did you have a... a I was yeah. just curious. I'm, I'm going to have to... Take off soon. Take off yeah. somewhat soon. But I was just curious, you know, how it would be um, for you to each comment on each other's sort of position, you know, because what I see is I see Jim as having his, um, you know, sort of time spent here in this, you know, uh, at the end of the road in this community space to sort of deepen into a certain aspect and that you've spent your time deepening into another aspect so i was curious how it would be for you to maybe look and see what you see in each other mm, or mm. something like that i don't i don't know it was just a, a suggestion as a way of sort of moving on yeah and mm -hmm. uh, and, and I had a discussion is is wonderful and, uh, and i know you guys could talk about the details of the ordeal for a good amount of time but um just yeah that, my that works for me yeah if it works for you guys do you want to ask the question, Frederick? Well, or? yeah. So um, I'd be curious to hear you each comment on each other's circumstances and sort of what you observe uh, from outside. Because there's always, in my view, there's uh, um, uh, a certain intelligence of vision that can come from being outside the process. Yeah, I think we come at these days probably all the time that I've known you, and the, but the, the way that you've driven programs around the, uh, around the country, and now you're driving around the world, and all hail to you for that. And this, what we've developed here, is uh, suddenly in the back water, uh, back, it's almost the background of society. So, and we had, you know, 10 or 15 years of men's programs and women's programs and 
and we would have massive programs of women's and men's gatherings coming together we would have 70 or 80 people so that was our background and so there was a lot of color in there um, and a lot of influence on the style of uh, the program that we put on and we borrowed a lot of that material and transformed it and brought it into the programs that we were doing for our fathers and boys and so what we've developed here, I mean, I spoke to her last night in the circle and at the end, you know, that we've deepened the program and we've bonded it with the land here. And we've bonded it with its, uh, from its origin. And we've attempted to take it out into the, into the, into the regions. We spent five years doing that. We probably did 15 or 20 programs, training weekends out there in the different major centers. Like I said earlier, it was the land that we couldn't find easily. And uh, uh, what we found was uh, that, uh, that the men, as true to Don's quote, you know, you yeah, want to create a vehicle, I dream of creating a vehicle that's so beautiful and that they won't be able to uh, take their hands off of it, but it needs to be flawed so that they will be involved. You know, so what we found out there was, as soon as the guys got the chance, and I think you had this experience too, you take a program out there, people want to get involved, they want to do it their way. It's true community development work, this. So when we, we lost the capacity to go out there through, for financial reasons. We stayed home and we deepened into our work here. And now we see ourselves as the National Training Centre for New Zealand or wherever. We've, uh, you know, we're open for spreading the word to wherever. And that it seems to work quite well. And also people want to get personally involved the people that have power and ability to do this work want to have their hand in it, of course, you know, because it's uh, the choreography and the beauty of the, so the spirit aspect of these programs is great. So it picks people up and in that liminal space, you know, it transforms, you know, we start and then spirit moves and who knows, you know, I've witnessed the last day or 24 hours when you guys have been here and we brought men and women in. What happened is what happened. And we could not have predicted what would happen. Yeah. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. And I would say, um, despite the fact that we haven't had a lot of close communications uh, for around the work we're doing, you know, really for nearly 10 years, yeah that the similarities in our evolution are much greater than the differences. You know, yeah. we also tried getting out into regions and, and through the Pathways Foundation, you know, at one point we were in eight different regions and, and you know, now to the best of my knowledge, Pathways runs programs in one, maybe two regions. Uh, and, you know, my conclusion that I've come to also is to run my programs locally and to deepen it locally but to have that as a training point so that we can train other people to go out and do their programs in the same way sorry in their own way so that we can train people to go out and do programs in their own way culturally and geographically appropriately to where they live and, and, and even that in the past six, 12 months, uh, in, in my work, there's been a lot more of the men and the women coming together and collaborating on the work. You know, maybe eight, 10 years ago, when the women came in and started doing it, you know, a lot of it was very separate. And, and now there's a lot more communication. And, 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 you know, lo and behold, last night when we had our meeting here, all the tracks men and all the tracks tides women were there. 
And, you know, from what I understand, that's not been the norm up until now. But last night, it felt very natural. Oh, great. Yeah. And so, you know, there's another thing happening where, you know, the men and women involved in this work are coming together. And, you know, in my opinion, that that gives much greater power of the work to everyone. Yeah, and I think the individual the men's and the women's programs for rites of passage need to be separate. Would you agree with that? Yeah, oh, look, I, I, I actually have a dream, and I've had this for a long time, that there'll be a mountain, and there'll be a men's program going on over here, and there'll be a women's program happening over here, and at some point, especially the more the young men and the young women, I'm less drawn to this with the, the, the older men and women, but the young men and the young women will actually come and sit together. Imagine that, whatever the gathering is, you know, deep into a rite of passage program, a group of young men and young women sit there facing each other and really listen and really get to speak from their hearts. You know, imagine, the power of that work, instead of waiting until 30, 40, 50 or whatever to be looking at, you know, those sorts of relationships, to, to be able to really have those discussions at the age of, you know, 14, 15, 16 would be incredible. And, and, and my personal belief on it is that it's critical for men to do work together and it's critical for women to do work together and it's becoming more and more obviously critical for men and women to do work together. Yeah, uh, you know, I've seen it. I'm Melissa Michaels, she works with both genders at the same time. And um, I, 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 I think that it works on the whole, and I think that that is one threshold that doesn't get crossed by the, the men, the young men, um, meaning that they'll only allow a certain level of vulnerability because of fears of being judged by the women. And, and it also complicates matters significantly because there's all these beautiful young women running around and yeah, that's well, a well, major distraction. Hormones get in the room. Pardon me? Hormones get in the room. Hormones? Hormones. Oh, hor yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, hormones. Yeah, hormones are running rampant. Of and course. It, you know, but but, so I wanted to make that comment, and I'd love to hear your response, but I also want to feed into this, this, this stream the notion that uh, I think there's two reasons why that is a sort, of, a sort of an inevitability in a way. And one is sort of the institutional growth, if you will, of men's work and women's work, that they've grown and matured over the last 30 years. And, um, and so they're ready for this challenge in a way. Yeah, and then and then you know the second thing is is sort of the individual work in a, in the sense of that's where the rubber really meets the road, right? If you're in a heterosexual relationship, you know we can do all of this work about you know how wonderful we are as men on men's weekends, but until we can meet the challenges of our wives day to day, it doesn't mean a goddamn thing in 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 my experience in many ways. That's where the rubber really meets the road. Yeah, look, I mean, there's a couple of things here I would make mention to. The first is, I almost feel like there's a fear that, you know, from people that if we start doing men's and women's work together, they think that that's the end of men's work and women's work. And I don't feel that has to be that yeah. at all. And the other thing that I feel strongly about is that, you know, it's not about coming to these workshops and being fantastic on the workshop and then a monster when you go home, it should actually be the other way around. You should kind of be a monster on the workshop and show your real self mm -hmm. so that when you go home, you can actually be a decent person. Yep. So, I mean, th I mean that, this is something that I just see in, you know, in personal development work in general. There are people who can become junkies to personal development work and on, on workshops, they're fully loving and beautiful and everyone thinks they're amazing. And then at home, you know, they don't speak to their partner or whatever, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can we agree that rites of passage need to, programs need to be done sex separately? Men with men and women and boys and women with women and that when you've been through those rites of passage programs, 
what we call a returning young men or a returning young women, that then is the time to start thinking about bringing those two uh, initiated groups together. Well, to me, uh, yeah, can we agree on that? Well, I, I agree with the concept of it, and and I think that's where we're we're at. Uh, but I'm also aware it's interesting that you know there just is a rapidly changing world, and the whole thing around gender, whether I agree with it or not, is changing, and that more and more we're we're getting people saying I actually don't relate to either gender, and. Whilst, you know, I, I will always love, but I will always love men's work mm. and I'm always be a fan for women's work. I don't know that, you know, I was thinking, the truth is I was thinking this the other night, I wonder whether sometime down the road we'll be running a rite of passage with men and women bringing boys and girls and we might have a father bringing a daughter or a mother bringing a son or a father bringing a son, you know, I'm literally at the point of asking myself the question, I don't have the answer, but could we actually run a rite of passage with mixed gender adults and mixed gender children, you know, would we actually be able to do something? And Well again, Melissa's doing it and she's yeah, having no, some she's success. Not, she's not doing a proper rite of passage, so she doesn't... Well, she calls it that. Yeah, but it's not that way. <laughs> it's not that way. There's not a challenge point and now you're a young man or you're a young woman. It doesn't happen. Well, yeah, they don't she cross it. with the creative abilities. Yeah. Transforms people. And she also thinks she glosses up her work quite a lot. Yeah. It comes to, well, uh, I think... That's what I honestly think. Yeah. Yeah, we've had her here doing programs with men and women and so on and so forth. It's not a situation where you can initiate men or initiate women. Uh, we're so different as genders. Well, the, it would be uh, uh, not disrespectful to yeah. try and try and do that all together. I think. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe old-fashioned. I think you like the challenge of the idea of it, Anna. That's what I think. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested in it. A, a great facilitator, you know, like a challenge. So you're creating situations. This is my observation. Yeah, yeah. It will challenge you and you're winning because you're who you are. But I don't think it helps with the bigger picture, you know, because other people haven't got your ability. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, you know, I, I'm interested in it. I, I literally don't know the answer. I mean, I do know that I get, you know, more and more women coming and saying, you know, can I do the rite of passage with my son? And my answer's always been no. You need to find a you know a, a male relative or a male friend, or we need to find a mentor, and and, and you know and, we, and we've always stuck with that, a, and we may stay with that, but but I think you know we should always be allowed to ask the questions, and then you know we work out the answers, and and right now it's a question, and and I and I and I and you know I just name that I literally don't have the answer. Um, well, my, my suspicion is it's going to be both and pretty soon, meaning that there'll, there'll be, both will be available and that there'll be different experiences, period. There'll be different experiences <coughs> and, and, yeah. you can, and you can't necessarily say, okay, one is the definitive crossing of the threshold. Why not? Why not? Well, Why not? Be, I, because that's, because that's not, because that's that's not for us. That's what history tells us. Yes, that's what true. That's what indigenous mind. True. Tells us. But that's Look, not we for have us it. to say, though, right, yeah. Jim? Because we can't Why not? say... Why not? Well, we, it's not for us to judge, though. You are initiated because you've done this. I mean, we can we can say we, we honor you, we see you for having done this work and, and threat, but the proof has to be in the pudding. It has to be in the young person. The yeah. young person has mm -hmm. to be altered and transformed, and they have to speak and testify to how it is they're a different yeah, being the from proof, before. The proof is in the consciousness. I see it because rites of passage, unconscious rites of passage, happen all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they're not recognized, yeah. not brought to a place of awareness, mm -hmm. not witnessed, mm -hmm. lo they lose their value. So something which is risky and challenging in a rites of passage environment can be literally risky 
and challenging out there, like driving a car too fast after drinking alcohol, that's risky and challenging. Yeah. It can be uh, produce a thing called death. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. talking it's about not, sort of an not unconscious not. writer. I'm talking about, let's say for argument's yeah. sake, you know, a yeah. Melissa Michaels thing, you know, versus the yeah. traditional look, way that you've done it with tracks and tires. I would look at it and go, we already break some fundamental rules. I mean, of a classical rite of passage, because historically, a boy's father would not be on his rite right. of passage. Right. You know, would, it would be the elders. Or uncles. It would be the uncles or it would be particular Even, you know, people. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But in a lot of them, the boys would be taken away by the, you know, the shamans or the, you know, the ritual leaders. And, and, and if a boy's father was there, he was not there as his father. Mm -hmm. He was there just as one of the men. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, on your program, you, you probably approximate that more closely because you do separate the boys mm -hmm. from the fathers. Yeah. But a boy is still very aware he's there with his father. He goes home with his father. You know, definitely in most cultures after a rite of passage, the boys would go and live in the young man's camp. On their own. And, and, and yeah, and have mentors. So... I just, you know, there there are lots of uh, different things. You know, at the end of the day, what we're wanting is, you know, this shift from child psychology to adult psychology. We're wanting them to get in touch with who they really are and to bring their gifts to the community. And um, so you've got to separate them from their fathers. You've got to at some point, they need, to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we also have to recognize that they're then going to go home with their fathers. So even though we may separate them, yeah. as soon as it finishes, they're back in the car, they're with their dads. Yeah. It's, you know, it's tricky. There, there are well, they some... They don't have dads. The other thing or they don't have dads. Yeah. 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 Do we I'm need to go? You got to go, okay. Um, so can you leave it on a wide shot yeah. of the three of us? Yeah. And then... Um, Every 12 minutes, you've got to... Exactly. What do we need to bring tonight? We bring our computer. I'll bring my computer. I've got a VGA adapter. Have you got an HDMI cable? Uh, it'll be VGA. Okay. Yeah. Because the last place I was at, they just used an HDMI. I've got a VGA adapter. You've got one. Yeah. Have you got a USB stick? You can just. Br I don't know if I've got one. Yeah, I've got a USB stick. If for some reason it doesn't, it will work. Macintoshes yeah. work. Which of these have we not used yet? These ones we have not used, that one we have. Okay. And we're going to get there at five, between 5.30 and quarter to six, Jay. So we have basically yeah. 25 to 30 minutes left. Yep. Okay. And then I, I slot it in where? Right here? Okay. Great. All right. Um, and we have what on this? About five minutes left here? No. Okay. <laughs> how can you tell? And how will I know when it's, it's, yeah, yeah, when it's finished? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You'll have to, you, you know, like, is yeah, there a flashing light up? Over there? Uh, I thought I did see Watch it, Jim, 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 stop, stop. Oh, oh thanks. Whoops. <laughs> much more interesting. Yeah. As I espouse my heretical ideas. <laughs> Well, I, I just think I we're in a trans for you. <laughs> trans transition time is all, and, uh, there, and there, there's nothing fixed and definitive about this ever. Okay. Is that all right, Jay? You should do the erector thing. Uh, I'm already a half an hour late. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, message thank you. Message to, to the kids. The GoPro is. Do done. you have something to show, uh, Frederick's uh, films um, on? Yep, yeah, I'll bring my laptop and it'll be all set up, ready to go. Jim. Thanks, Jay. Sorry we've made you late, mate. No, no, I, I sent a message an hour ago saying yeah. that I was going to be late. Yeah, I'm not hearing you, Jim. Uh, okay. there was, there's been trouble with that one. It's, it hasn't been that great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, mate. Thank you, Jay. If you could um, bring it all with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah? And what about cards? I mean, are, do you have other cards? No, I'm going to, yeah, I've got other cards for the GoPro. Um, it's going to be, Go, it's gonna be uh, GoPro and iPad tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, bring the whole lot, please. Okay. Well, if I can, I'll try to dump all this onto my own computer beforehand, in which yep. case we could free it up. There's a card reader there. Oh, you have a card reader. Okay. Yeah. It's all a bit of a mess in here. 
Could you count to ten for me, please? One, two, three, four, I'm not picking five, up at all. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Love you guys. Thank you, Thank Jay. Thank you, Jay, so much. This is fun. Be fiery too, yo. Yeah. That's quite good. I mean, yeah. we need to be able to have there's, these there's bloody discussions. By the front door in the charger. Oh, okay. There's another battery. Okay. Um, boy, help me remember all that, will you? Because bring stuff. everything. There's another battery there. Yeah, there's stuff everywhere. The old um, farm traditions confronting the young dude who's out there making it happen. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna play old bull and young bull. Yeah, there you go. Let me switch it off and try it it's again. Is it mute? Is it mute, Kelly? No. Where it fell on the ground? No. I'd be playing with the cable more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. Test, test, test. Check, check, check. Check. No, I'm picking up on my own mic. Actually, you need to test it. If you could. Check, check. Is it pulled? Check, it looks like check, it's pulled out a bit there. Check. Yeah, I think it might just be the cable itself is just right. no good at this point. I really stressed it when I walked it on the ground. I'm sorry. That's all right. <coughs> it was already damaged before. I think I'm going to have to cut this thing open and take a look. Um, you want some Do you want to continue the conversation at all? Or have we got what you wanted? Well, yeah, no, I'd like to continue it. Um, I'm just, maybe I should duck out of the middle yeah. of it. Uh, and then and I'll, you're, I'll give you my mic. Even if Jim's got yours, your stuff will get picked up on our mics, won't it? Yeah, and I'm not so interested in what I have to say anyway. I mean, however enlightening it might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give you the out a second, then we'll watch you in the middle. <coughs> but until then, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> <coughs> danger, I think, in the direction you're going is that you will do an incomplete, lukewarm initiation, which is a tragedy. Yeah, but I just need to say, I'm not saying that's the direction I'm going, I'm saying that they're the questions I'm asking. And they're two different things. And, 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 I, and I, I absolutely agree so that doing lukewarm, incomplete rites of passage or initiations yeah, well, there's, it depends how you define. <laughs> Correct. But that they shouldn't be lukewarm, I agree. But, but I, I won't be stopped from asking questions. And, dis and, you know, this is the, that's why we had trustees for years in Pathways, to be able to debate stuff. Yeah, of course. Could you move that chair out <coughs> in the middle, please? Oh, you want to totally get rid of it? Yeah, just get rid of it and, and <coughs> maybe you can move your chairs a little closer. Okay. Okay. To eyeball you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Let's go watch out for those things that go way over backwards. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I don't really want to go way over backwards. Oh. Yeah. Are we filming yet? Uh, no. Now the Melissa, see, I wouldn't say the Melissa Michael stuff on film. Oops, I guess, yeah, are we filming? I don't want this on film, what I'm about to say. Okay. I really, I just want to make it clear, this is actually important, that... I can't tell if we're on or on. <laughs> well, regardless of whether we are or not, yeah, I, there's stuff I don't want said on film. Yeah, and I'm uh, a bit worried uh, to say agree, it because I don't I even want it accidentally with, ending up I on film. I agree with you about the Melissa Michaels bit, you know. Mm -hmm. she, well, I'm sorry that she's not here to participate yeah, in the conversation. Yeah. Oh, she so. would be great. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. Was here, yeah. We'd have so Are we? Fi fun. Is it filming or not? I don't know. We would have so much fun. Well, we have to know whether it's filming because I don't want to do 20 minutes of filming and not know if it's filming. I, I'm assuming it is filming at this point. Based on? Based on... Uh, the fact that the the button that I pushed to start filming 
seems to reset and do something each time, but it doesn't give me a light on or an indication that it is rolling. So uh, maybe. How close did you get to the what, what happens when you stop it? Let's talk about it later offline. In case it's not very. Yeah, I don't, I don't. It's a whole other discussion. Yeah. I thought we were. Ah, now we're rolling. Now we're rolling. Okay, cool. You want me to shut it off? No, 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 no. We'll talk later. What? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have to use it either. You yeah, can trust no, me. I, I, I need to. And I'd like to have the discussion later offline. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're in the midst of a very, uh, just a segue in here. There's a, there's a classical sort of adversarial scenario happening here, which is a discussion around um, the adhering to the classical principles of a rite of passage and what's negotiable and what's non-negotiable and looking at different ways of integrating it into our society. And, 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 I, and I, uh, for me, it's important to say that there's not one way that's right or wrong at, at either end. And the most important is that we actually have the discussions. You know, I mean, I'm interested in whether, for example, a rite of passage can be created by a football team, you know, as part of their training. And, and you know, even whether to, I, I've, I've looked at, you know, in order to do a rite of passage, do you have to take them away into a container that is created once and then they return? Or can you actually create that container periodically over say six or 12 months where they're into the container and then they're back out and then they're back in and then they're back out. And then, you know, over that period of time, this transition from boy to young man or one stage in life to the next takes place. And, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's just critical that we look at different options and, and, and then work out what we feel yeah, is the most appropriate and will give the best result to the people who are coming through it. Yeah, I, my, where I come from with this is that there's, there's very limited research on modern initiation and that I would, if we're playing games and experimenting with different models, uh, we won't know for years if that worked or not. How do we know if the programs that we're doing anyway work? And the reason, you know, you mentioned, uh, for instance, one of the classic parts of, uh, of the separation is to separate the boy from his family and to separate him from his father. And uh, we do that for two reasons. One is to comply with that traditional approach and separate the boy from his father, and the father goes into his own group. And then, because what I see in modern society is that there's very few men who have a right of passage. There's very few initiated men out there. And I, I think you would, I, we had a discussion earlier about who gets most, the boy or the father. And often I see the father gets as much, if not more, more than the boy. And he's separated in a separate group of men, and often for a lot of fathers, this is the first time they've actually had a conversation, deep conversation about deep subjects uh, with a group of men. So I don't think we should miss that opportunity of separating boys and men. The other thing I think is that the boys don't get sent off as a group. They get put in a close encounter with boys that have been initiated and men usually in their 30s, who we see as being good men, as being mature young men. So they get that experience of being in that group. Because so, I think that the, a boy, will, the voices that he hears best are closest to his age range. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, depending, yeah, often, but not always. Yeah. and. The experience that we had trying to bring men's and women's groups together, 
after three or four days, which is why we classic the way we did it for about ten years. And uh, you have a group of men over there, thirty men over there, thirty women over here, and they meet for about three days, and they have a symbolic coming together, and they do some rituals, some expression together, uh, a ritual circle, and as part of that. And then they separate and they go back and they talk about it. What did we find there? And we talked about creating universal men and universal women, archetypally coming together. Uh, fuck, it was incredible. And uh, the energy was fantastic. And we tried fish bowling. But as soon as women as a group, uh, uh, men all the way around the outside, but out of it in the darkness you know uh, literally at night time and the women talking there it didn't get anywhere at all the men wouldn't open up to the same depth or they were playing games for the women mm. and the women were playing games and I think that's true if you get a circle of men or a circle of women and you put one person the opposite gender in the circle the whole thing changes you know, historically, I would have said I 100% agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think we're in a transition time where that's becoming a generational split, that that's true for men your age, my age, even Arna's age, but not necessarily true for men in their teens and 20s now. And, it's, and it has to do with growing up in a post-feminist society, I think, at some level. You know, that they've, they've been acculturated vastly differently than we were acculturated. And you could comment on that if you want, but I, I, I was struck by something you said too, Jim, that we have no way of knowing or measuring, if you will, whether it's a success or not with an initiation. No, how, no matter what we do. Well, how, how can that be? Because to me, the, 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 again, the, the proof is always in the, the visible, uh, uh, expressive transformation of the young person. So when they themselves can testify, I, I can't believe what I've just been through. I can't believe it. My life will never be the same again. They don't literally say those words, but sometimes they do. But so what percentage? How many of these young men that have been initiated have you interviewed all of them? No, no, is no. Is your no. survey complete, or is this just one or two that you've seen? No, no, no. It's but it's observational. One or two are, are, are transformed. There's well, we 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 um we do a survey at the talk, end of talk amongst each other. We do a survey at the end of every program that we do. Yeah. And we us too. Yeah. Universally get positive feedback from yeah. the men and the boys. Yeah. But for me, you know, a survey at the end of the camp yeah. is not a gold standard right. survey. But some years ago, we did do a survey um, through Pathways of boys three years after the camp, or young men, uh, compared to young men three years after the, who hadn't been on a camp of the same age, same demographic, independent research. And there was found to be a statistically significant difference in the ones who had been on a program of having better relationships with their fathers, more respect for women, uh, a greater desire to finish school, and more uh, tendency to want to get involved in community work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was actually, you know. Good to hear. Yeah, independent research. Mm. We, our research is mainly about the second stage. See, I see rites of passage as being two stages. The first of all is just a conscious name change. It's now they come in as boys and they go out as young men. Recognized, consciously acknowledged by the community, by their family and so on and so forth. Then we bring them back to a second stage and they come on, te on team and they get put into service and they get the responsibility of seeing a new boy come through. And some of those young men have come back a number of times. You saw the, some of them in the circle last night. Um, you know, they've been several times back. And uh, so you, our observation of those young men is 
that they are fantastic, but not all of them come back. Uh, not all of them come yeah. for a second. So I wonder about those boys, the initiated boys that are out there. So I'm pleased to hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to see all the, the, the young men come back. I, I think rites of passage are multiple stages. It's an ongoing process. It is. It um, is. And it is wonderful, the young men that we do get back, but I also find even ones that we don't get back that I see many years later, mm. you know, pretty much universally, they will talk about that as having been a pivotal point in their lives. A and generally when I mention to boys, you know, because I, I, I now am 15, 20 years down the road, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting young men in their late 20s and early 30s, yeah, been on these programs, may have children of their own, and their attitude and, and, and even just their preparedness to speak honestly and openly mm. is to me a sign that yeah. you know, it worked for them. If I ask them how they are, they'll actually tell me. Yeah. And I get a number of who walk back into this house, you know, with yeah. the beard and the big deep voice and the girlfriend in tow, you know. I say, who are you? You don't recognize me, do I? I came through tracks, you know, 10 years ago. So we have a conversation because I don't remember all their names. Yeah. And so that's cool. That's yeah. cool. It's very cool. Yeah, I just don't want to, you know, I want to be as, as classical as we can, as uh, su substantiated as we can in this work. I don't want to, I don't want to find out later on that we've wasted our time, we've wasted their time. I would like to talk about more about the initiation of men, the fathers, and the eldership part. I'd like to talk about that a bit more too, and when we get to it. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, the problem is there is no classical, really. I mean, in, in my view, you know, what there are are different, you know, in indigenous practices around the world, very vastly different from each other. And there's all of the philosophizing about it and the writing about it by different people like Van Gennep and yeah. whoever, you know, yeah. um, Robert Moore and et al. Uh, so because there's no classical, I had this discussion with Bill Plotkin via email. I said, you know, how, what, what, who determines the purity standard? What is pure and what isn't? None of us know. We're all trying to invent this thing together because we recognize the need, but none of us know. None of us have the gold standard. So I'm actually a little bit surprised. Uh, I'm curious, well, do you feel the same way too, that you can't really know whether it's been a success until many years later? Um. Look, I don't have an issue knowing that it's been a success. Mm -hmm. I, I know they're a success. I, I don't, you know, I mean, we have some research and we meet people, but I, I, I know they are. I see those boys. I see how they, they come out of the programs. I see them years later. I speak to their mothers. I speak to their fathers. I get the emails 10 years down the track. It's not an issue for me to know that it has impact how we can maximize that impact, how we can have more impact, you know, is another question again. Uh, you know, I would like to see every one of them come back as a returning young man a number of times. I would like to see them getting involved in the leadership more and more. I think, yeah. you know, oh, that, sorry, that's... Uh, time out, I just realized I ran out of my card here. Let me just make a quick change and then we'll be on our last that's card. Really short, those cards. They are, right? they're 12 minutes and... Uh, that's, this is the price I pay for not having brought my own camera. Yeah, I don't think we're, I think we're digging a hole for ourselves here talking about... That's not one that's been used? No, these two had not been used. All right. What are you wanting to communicate here? I'm sorry. What's the outcome? The, what are we? What outcome are we aiming at? 
Well, I, what I, the outcome that I think is that you know there's two, two, and a half <laughs> of uh, of the the best educated minds about this subject matter having a discussion about some of its uh, fine points, and that that can be of some use to people uh, in the field and possibly even outside the field. That's my thought. Okay. You have a twinkle in your eye when you say that. <laughs> Do I? Well, it's it's because I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At least the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, yeah. I, oh wow! Now, what the hell's going on now? Ay ay ay! See, I don't know this camera at all. Well, Switching it off and turning it on again here. Charge our home. Bust another one. So what, what, which avenue are we going down at the moment? I'd like to talk a little bit about why we separate the fathers. Yeah. I'd rather hear about eldership and the yeah, rights of passage of the men. Part of the same story. Yeah. Good, because that, that's, that's something you requested and I think that's a very interesting. Okay, so you know, going way back to the uh, men's events which we started 25 years ago and as an uninitiated men ourselves, so, what do you, you know, there weren't any elders around the, uh, to initiate us, so we messed around for years and created different rituals to initiate ourselves. And then, fast forward to the Rites of Passage events, and the early years of doing the Rites of Passage events with boys and their fathers, and we found that in the in the men's group, the father's group, um, that men were getting a serving of involvement for themselves. You know, they even speaking about it, you know, I've not done anything like this myself. And, and I had mothers feeding back to me afterwards, finding out, saying, what did you do to him? You know, he's come back. I, and one morning I can remember saying, I was gonna leave him after this boy, after the boy, I was going to leave him and saying, you know, what did you do? And I said, we initiated him, which was a lie, but he'd been through a men's event and he witnessed an initiation. So the next step was to see, well, what is the men's path? What is the men's pathway? So he is a young man, he grows up, he gets married, he has children, the children grow up, he is uh, to an age where they can be taken away for an initiation, he's there too. And now he's, he's uh, witnessing his initiation, he's getting up and he's telling his stories, his deepest stories, and his son's hearing him telling stories he's never heard, and he's breaking down, he's having, getting angry, and he's having tears, and so on and so forth. And so after a bit, you know, one of the things we we found was that there are certain men that stand in a certain way of authority and depth. So we needed to recognize them. So we called them onto what we call the eldership path. And the eldership path was 
uh, symbolized by giving them a stick which they held. So ours is a talking stick culture. And this is like I did with you last night, Frederick, you know, I see you're on the eldership path, and you know, when you really stand up and have a speak about it. And uh, so every time the man feels honored, he feels recognized, and he has something deep to say, like you were, uh, for me, you were, uh, your speaking seemed to deepen last night when you were holding that stick. It may just be just coincidental, but I choose to be. So we might get to recognize a couple of fathers in that time, and they come back in service to, and they come, and they get invited back to the men's groups to hold the men, the fathers, in future events. And so I do have some follow-up with those men. And I manage the youngest 40 something, 48, 49, even 51, Anna. Um, you know, there's no question that that person, as with you, you're on this path towards the wisdom culture. You know, you know more about men's culture and so on than many other people do. So you need to know what your office is. And so the office of eldership and the initiation of men is a part of rites of passage and we can blend it in beautifully with our initiation of the boys. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Back in the day we used to offer men scarring and so on. You know, and they would, they would be buried and whatever, uh, gruesome rituals in here because we were mean to ourselves because we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have any elders to hold that because ritual elders are supposed to hold safety and say stop or whatever it is. And so we want to, I want to, as part of the program, we want to gradually develop enough elders to be able to hold these events. You know, when I cop it, you know, I've gone down the hole. And it's wonderful for me, as an older man, to be with these men, because they're such a pleasure. They so have such maturity and humor and depth and irreverence and whatever else. So, yeah, uh, I think that we can accomplish both those things. I hope so. And the women have taken it on too. Susie and her programs, you know, they recognize mothers and they bring them back through and the wise woman, the crone. Yeah, I look forward to a meeting. And we've had a couple of eldership events where we've tried to, tried to investigate this, you know. And that's fascinating, fascinating. It's not easy to stand up in this day and age and represent something, whatever it is, age maturity, I dare to say wisdom, at least experience, it's not easy. Because of the, the tall poppy syndrome is rabid in our society. Yeah, it's the sibling society of Robert Bly, as we know, yeah. That's what I have to say about eldership. Well, and, and what contributes to that too is, you know, is postmodernism. Uh, you know, and all of the the younger generation, you know, they tend to think of almost absolute relativism is is the standard by which all things are measured because everybody yeah. has their yeah. own subjective experience, yeah. and there is no absolute anything. Mm. You know, and and by that, you know. I mean, culture has disintegrated in, effectively, uh, and there's nothing to bequeath to, to subsequent generations, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, and, and and you see the result in that when they, uh, the, the only thing that they believe in, if, if anything, is multiculturalism, and they take it to such a high standard that that too becomes destructive because it becomes PC and it becomes these these barriers mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. inclusion 
you know, that if you don't uh, uh, sort of kowtow to, to the PC gods, then you, you don't fit in. You, you can't fit in. And so your, your own truth, even if it's, a, you know, a racist or homophobic truth, there's no place for it to be heard. It's precluded out of the discussion, you know? Yeah, I think it's in, see, what I, what I like about the culture that we've got is very old. It's walking around a fire. And walking around a fire, you embody who you are and what your story is, what you're telling. The corporization of that particular person. And you can tell just sort of the way a man stands and walks around. You, know, you saw it last night. It's just the way a man stands and talks around. You can tell a lot about who he is. And, uh, and after two or, three, uh, two or three days with that man, we have seen him stand up and speak half a dozen times. You know, it might be telling a story about what it was like for him to be when he was a teenager, what was this uh, about sexuality and intimacy, about mentoring, or whatever. It, when, when the emotion hits him, when he tells the deep true story and the emotion moves in him, it's embodied and it's beautiful. And, uh, and of course it happens with the boys too. Absolutely. When we first started the events, it was difficult if the boys have a, an own talking stick, a boy's talking stick. And they, after they've been through their major ritual, they get to hold the men's talking stick. But to get them up and walking around the fire and telling a story, and we have them bring a childhood item, a teddy bear or a picture or something, uh, so they, they are invited to stand up and walk around the fire as they've seen people doing for a couple of days and tell the story of their childhood item. And that way we've got it nailed because just for a boy to stand up in front of 40 men and boys is really hard. Really hard. And so uh, getting older boys, I think older boys get more. 14, 15, 16, 17. It's, I think they can hear more. It's harder to get them through the door, I think, but I think they get much more. Yeah. That's what I have to say, yeah. Any comments you want to make, Arna? I think one of the a shift that's happened in our work over the last 10 years, 15 years, is that initially it was very much just about the boys hearing the men's stories, just being in witness to it. Um, and we have now brought the boys more and more into the conversation. So the boys have an opportunity to hear the stories of the men, but then we ask the boys, and, and this speaks to the power of story that, you know, I mean, our first conversation we always have is a circle where the men talk about the relationships they've had with their own fathers yeah. when they were the age that the boys, right. that they've brought on the camper. And it's a very powerful conversation for yeah. a lot of the men. Yeah. Sometimes half of them cry. Yeah. And, and it might go on for a couple of hours. And these boys, you know, and there are boys there who've been diagnosed with ADHD and got all sorts of personality problems apparently and all these issues, they don't move. They sit there totally still, totally. completely focused yeah. for two to three hours, which in itself is a big statement. Yeah. And then at the end, when we ask the boys a question along the lines of, you know, if you're a father one day and you have a son, what would you like your son to say about you as a father? Which effectively is saying to the boys, what sort of father do you want now? Um, the, the depth, the profundity of the answers that we get from the boys is magnificent. Mm -hmm. But if we'd spend two hours telling the boys how to be fathers, yeah. 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 
they would have fallen asleep, been running around all over the place. Um, so th th for me, we cut. Did you cut then? Uh, unfortunately, the battery and That's all right. thing ran out. Uh, hang on, don't take it off yet. Because I've got one more card, but I have to change the battery as well. So. Oh, I thought that was the last card. No. There's, there's all right, well, just because Jace, I, I don't know, I was under the impression there's one more card. You may have recorded over a card. No, no, believe me, I haven't recorded over a card. All right. I took the two cards that were unrecorded out so that I would know which one was recorded. So there's one left. Oh, I did think I saw Jay putting one into there. He did. All right. Here. There is one in here that's recorded. Okay. Yeah, that was the first one. But at any rate, we'll see if I can change the battery here. And then we'll oh, I'm sorry, the camera is uh, not what you want. Well, it's, believe me, yeah. I... Yeah, we could have... We had a discussion about this uh, many times, actually, Jay and I via email, and... Uh, it, uh, it just seems so impractical and unlikely to get a professional crew over here from Nelson, you know, and, uh, and to do it on repeated days would have been even more unlikely. So, um, you know, we're, we're making the best of it and that'll be all right. You know, it'll yeah, be what it'll be. be, what it'll be. Yeah. Now that, the power of story, oh, true story, real story. Yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. I think that's why uh, 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 why the book has turned out like that because some of those some of those stories, those true stories, came back from the people that I know. There's power. Yeah, but there's very little power. Well, we're talking two different things. We're talking power of stories. You're talking power of batteries. Oh, you were looking at me when you said power, so I thought you saw some light on the camera or something. Mm. Yeah. I wish you could have a week. You know. Me too. Somebody should write a, a book or an essay or something. And, uh, initiation in the postmodern age. Yeah. I don't even know where the batteries are on this thing. Is there some battery left? Uh, I have to swap out the batteries, but uh, he said that he was had the, the charger on, so presumably there's another battery that's somewhat charged that we can use. But this plate that he has is very sticky. I can do this, I suppose. What time do you have the video in the morning? Seven. It's not too, it's not too, uh, not too dramatic. Not too, uh, Take me 10, 15 minutes to pack. Yeah. Where are you going to? The Gold Coast. Give me a talk tomorrow at Southport School, which is the most exclusive school on the South, on the Gold Coast apparently. And then a, the next night at Barker College in Sydney is also very exclusive. And then next week, next Friday night, I'm running a Young Warriors for this Gold Coast school on their school oval. So I have a whole heap of dads and boys camping on the school oval for the night, which will be nice. Get some fires. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you for your drive. Fantastic. Not sure whether it's me or if it comes from somewhere else. What would your dad say about that? <laughs> <laughs> he would have something very definitive to say about no that. No doubt. <laughs> He's a definitive guy.
Is Nick far away from here? Nick, um, if he's working, which he will be today, it's just um, in the barn paddock, his studio is down there. We can walk down there after him. Because we can't be here for much longer. No, we we're, gonna, we're getting tired on time. Yeah. I just have to write my talk. Yeah, I usually write them as I'm walking up the steps <laughs> to the podium to give them. Yeah, that's so good because, yeah, be... It's a really nice thing to just, you know, I was thinking about it even last night. Each time I spoke yesterday, I do not know what I'm going to say. And I don't know what I'm going to say. And I trust myself to find the words. That's, that's the, one of the aspects of the standing and talking around the fire. Yeah. Because... It throws people off their story. Yeah. Uh, something that they have formed in their head. Suddenly their front and center, I swear to God, the energy, yeah. energy is different out there. Yeah. I was fascinated by how you were walking half a circle with the two sticks and then you were changed. You're walking on the half a circle with the two sticks and then you were changed. Yeah. Interesting. Trying to bring rhythm into my um, daily life. <laughs> That's the interesting thing about learning jazz piano. It's not just about playing the notes, it's about understanding, it's about rhythm, it's about volume. You know, there's all these different aspects that you have to do. And you have to be able to play one thing with your left hand, boom, 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 and that has to stay the same. While your right hand's going, da -na 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 -na. you know, whatever, and it's like, you know, they literally have to be doing different things and keeping time. That makes sense? Kippa, and how do people uh, do that? You know, uh, that they play an instrument and sing yeah. at the same time. We well, see those guys in the street sometime and they've got a thing with their feet and they've got their, you know. Oh, uh, Zabia there. Yeah, and they've got their, you know. Shit, I've yeah. never seen him live, but, you know, the picture I've seen him. I've like seen him live. Three digits and, have you? Is he good? Yeah, Is very good. Yeah, yeah, very good. So we were talking about the power of story. How far into that did we get? Um, basically, um, all but the last four or five sentences. Well, the beauty of the boys hearing stories from their fathers about fathering and the, the beauty of the answers, the profundity of the answers we get from the boys when we ask them about you know, what sort of fathers they want to be, how they want their sons to talk about them. A and you know, this idea that if we had spent our time telling the boys how to be a father, we would have completely lost them. 
but but when they hear real stories you know it touches them and they that that is the way of passing on wisdom and knowledge one of a father's greatest desires so to speak is to pass on his wisdom and knowledge to his son but the the paradox is that that doesn't happen by telling your son how to live his life it happens by actually sharing about your own story good and bad and and the, the boys get as much from hearing the stories of the fathers who had unhappy relationships with their own fathers as they do from hearing the stories of the fathers who had happy relationships with their fathers I think it's special for the boys to see their father operating with a, a group of men and to hear their fathers uh, speaking to the, to the group as a whole, telling stories often that they wouldn't hear from their fathers at home. Of course, yeah, for the, you know, once a father, once a story takes off, once, once, this is how it is for me anyway, once I get involved with the story, with telling a story, I lose, lose the audience to some extent, in as much that I will go to places and go deeper and emotionally expound my story more than I would yeah. if I was just sitting and talking with you now, or talking with my son. Yeah. So just one-on-one -on -one with father and son is quite different for a whole group process. Yeah, but, but the other amazing thing about story is that you know, when a boy hears the story of his father or of other men, it starts to create this shift from, you know, I'm the man, I'm the father, you're the boy, to, you know, yeah. to this. It, it actually equals. builds community. When yeah. you know someone's story, then by knowing their story, you actually become part of their story. A and the sharing of story is an amazing and very powerful way of building communities. So it's not, you know, there, there are other additional benefits apart from just passing on wisdom and knowledge. Indeed. I mean, I do believe that in the, as an indigenous part of our, our brains, indigenous part of our souls, our spirits, which is a large percentage, is probably 99%. I mean, it's only two or three hundred years since we come into so-called civilization. So I think that is alive and well. And I think that one of the oldest forms, maybe the, old, the oldest form of communication has been sitting around a fire and telling stories as a group, as a family, as whatever. And it maybe goes back to before fire even, you know. But there's an old indigenous part of us who shows up there. Yeah, and it, there's two parts to the to the uh, telling of stories. One is the person who is actually expounding, actually standing and speaking the story, and the other part is the listening. Now, like you say, if it's a true deep story, the boys seem to be able to tell, because we've had school teachers who have come into our programs as fathers, of course, and they get up and they start talking like school teachers. I look around the circle, and I see the boys just turning off yeah. all over the place. But a real story, especially by the father, is profound. Yeah. 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 The mystery of story, the mystery of my story. That I, you can't ever tell the same story twice. Yeah. You can't do that because the listening shifts, the awareness shifts. Very powerful. So I see why it's one of the prime tenets of a race of passage. And uh, the old indigenous part of our brain, which is the large part of our brain, gets it. Well, the other thing about telling story is the boy gets to realize that the stories began before him and will go on long after him. And, and you know, one of the shifts from boy psychology to man psychology is this realization that I'm not the center of the universe, I'm not the only person. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the telling of stories and the connecting to this sort of lineage and, and realizing that 
I'm only a dot on the line, I'm not the actual line. That, that has a profound effect on a boy's psyche and, and they, that, that helps to promote this shift from understanding it's, you know, I need to not only be looking after myself, myself extends and I'm part of a much bigger story that actually involves, you know, my family, my community, and, and, you know, hopefully actually everybody in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a pathology which is coming into our ways of communicating. And it's to do with cell phones and these, you know, texting and messaging and things like that. And that it loses context. And I do think that one of the breakdowns that are happening in society is around the motive of confidence modes of communication. How often do families actually sit down, have the ritual of having food together and checking in with how your day is without the television running over there or whatever it is. And so I do think there's a certain pathology in that and it's t I do believe it's starting to show up in the behavior of people around the planet, especially kids. I want to, uh, in the brief time that we have left, uh, see if I, it's like five minutes, see if, uh, I, I'd be curious to hear you guys address the, the David Blumenkrantz issue. And David, uh, I don't, do you know David's work at all? I've heard of him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's worked in Rites of Passage for 30, 40 years, and, and, and one of his key points is that uh, he says there's no point in having a Rite of Passage program. It's got to be uh, an essential function of the community, and that you, you, you have to initiate somebody into something, and it has to be into that community. So they have to understand that their uh, stature has also shifted by virtue of their rite of passage, and that they're now uh, accepted as an equal you know, in the community, or it's shifted to elder or whatever, but in this case, shifted to equal. So. You know, in, in this community, I mean, in, in one sense, you, you have an advantage because, in a sense, the rites of passage grew out of the community itself. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's also a limitation because it's, you know, your rite of passage is defined by your community. Uh, and as we know, there's all kinds of people holding judgments about the community and perceptions out there about it. So I, I'm just curious about both of your thoughts yeah. around this. Look, if I may speak to that first, I, I agree with David that you know a, a rite of passage is into a community and involves a community. And, and if a boy, a young man, goes for a very powerful rite of passage, and and you know is actually ready for a new level of status in his life and able to take on more responsibilities, worthy of greater privileges, then goes back to his community and is not recognised. Uh, and he's treated the same as he was before, you know, that can actually create a great wounding. And, and you know, interestingly, your uh, program involves a big celebration when the young men return, as does ours, where we get families and friends and as many people as we can together yeah. Yeah. to recognise this return mm -hmm. of the young men. And yet, you know, I think it's the most difficult part of our program. One of the things we often get from the young men is that they go back and when they go back to school, it's quite traumatic for them yeah. because all of a sudden they see their whole school and their school friends differently. They see how immature it is and, and there's not a community gathering there. And you know, I think this is an ongoing issue for all of us that we need to keep working with and hopefully as rites of passage become more established in communities, there will in fact be a greater recognition. And, and I've started working with a few schools now who want to in fact bring in a school-wide recognition of the young men. In fact, one school that I'm working with in Australia are creating a rite of passage program for all of their year nine students, all 250 of them, and there'll also be a stream for the parents and a stream for the teachers, so that after they've been through the rite of passage, they will be seen differently in the school. And their parents will also be aware they've been through a process. You know, the idea being that there genuinely is a shift in the, 
you know, social status for whatever, for, you know, want of a better expression of that boy, young man, when he returns to his community after his rite of passage. Yeah, I believe you're right. And, you know, one of the situations we have here, uh, two years living at the end of a dirt road in a remote part of a Golden Bay in, in a small country of New Zealand, a lot of the families come from way back, uh, way out there. And they come here and they form this momentary community to welcome back their boys or young women. And then they go back to their, their places where they come from, which might be overseas even. And how do they relate? But, you know, over the week, over, uh, last night we were talking, yesterday we were meeting with some of the young men and women who have been through the programs. And what I've heard say, uh, followed by those, particularly by Isaac, who was there last night, he's, he was alarmed by how it was for him when he uh, went back into his school, into his community, because his friend, friends, so called friends, couldn't relate to who he was now. It's an intelligent yeah. response. Yeah. yeah. So he talked about having to make new friends. And the conversation we had yesterday about how those, how they could shift, how they could relate to others who have been initiated in the schools would work. But there's one young man who's been back about seven or eight times and he came back quite recently again into a training event and he actually spoke out the last time we saw him was about three years ago and he spoke out I'm not doing this again because I find it so hard to integrate when I go back out there that's terrible that's awful that's sad yeah, it really is but I see his point I see his point yeah yeah, it's sad and it's real. Yeah, it's real. and that's why a big part of our work mm. is about bringing rites of passage back into communities. Yeah. So the whole community recognises and celebrates. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's a long path we've been on. Yeah. You know, we're, between us, we've been doing this work for over, th you know, 35 years. Yeah. And slowly, slowly, there's an increasing awareness. But the hope is that we reach a tipping point where communities want this work, where communities welcome this work and create this work so that the young men and women who go through the programs genuinely get welcomed back. So that the, the men and women who go through this program genuinely move into eldership mm. and, you know, major things will happen. Yeah, I think I, I really herald your working with schools because of school, having a whole school involved that's the ideal community. Yeah. yeah. So you know, when, uh, those people who have been through a rice of passage, you know when they've been, um, the whole school can relate to them. Yeah. That's powerful. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, that's pretty much all I got. You guys got anything else? We got a couple minutes left. I'm good at that point. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you now have to go through all of that and deal with it for.